Welcome back. We just heard Jonathan Garner, Morgan Stanley's equity strategist. I now have with me Chetana here, the chief Asia economist, also from the sidelines of the 21st Asia Investors Summit. Chetan, thank you very much for joining me. You know, I would actually want to ask you more about India, but since this is an Asian Investor Summit, let me start with first the Asian question. Uh, you guys see Asia as an in an inflection point in 2023. Why are you so bullish on the Asian economies, Asian economies in 2023? So, Lata, I think uh, the, the title that we had for our year ahead outlook was that 2023 will be the year of disinflation. And the key premise for our constructive view on growth outlook is that we think inflation will uh, decline rapidly towards central bank's comfort zone. So by the middle of next year, we will have 90% of regions central bank having inflation within their comfort zone. And that means that the central banks will not have to take rates into restrictive territory supporting domestic demand. And that domestic demand strength, we think, will allow Asia to outperform U.S. growth. Uh, so Asia, we expect GDP growth to go from 3.5% right now to 4.6% in second half of next year. And at the same time, we're expecting the U.S. growth to remain weak at around 0.5%. So that means that the differential between Asia and U.S. growth will continue to widen, and that will make a Asia look very attractive uh, on a growth perspective. Well, uh, Chetan, I'm going to throw some skeptical questions at you, not because I want to disbelieve your thesis, uh, but just to strengthen my belief. You know, we, had, we have just got uh, the October trade data, and I asked even Jonathan this. The October trade data in India is a contraction, 16% contraction year-ago levels and month-ago levels. That has its impact on GDP, even if it is a smaller part. We are not a very export-dependent uh, country. Asia is much more dependent on uh, export uh, uh, growth, uh, Asian economies. Don't you think this is going to, you know, drag down Asia? So, look, I think we are expecting the external demand to remain soft, at least in the first half of next year. And the second half, you should see some improvement. Uh, but I think there are three reasons why we think that domestic demand will be strong and it will offset that weakness in external demand. Um, so the first is that, as I mentioned earlier, since inflation is coming in control much faster, policy rates will be uh, not having to go up into restrictive territory, and that will support the financial conditions in the regional economies. At the same time, we are expecting the dollar to weaken. We're expecting the U.S. rates to decline, and that will support Asian financial conditions in addition to support that domestic demand. The second reason is that we are still to reap the full benefits of reopening. So if you look at the services sector, particularly tourism-related activity, uh, it's a significant chunk of the economies and uh, GDP, and we have not seen that full realization of reopening benefits. So for example, in case of China, you're going to see that benefit coming in through from second quarter of next year. In Japan, you're going to see that benefit coming in through, and also the rest of the region uh, will see that benefit. And the third is that for, for a country like India and Indonesia, we are seeing that they are having their own business cycle now because the corporate sector balance sheet is clean, banking system balance sheet is clean, and therefore that's allowing for a, a recovery in uh, credit growth and domestic demand support coming in through that. At the same time, uh, we are seeing both these economies, uh, governments, implementing structural reforms that's encouraging private investment. So, you know, these are the three reasons, you know, monetary policy not being too tight, reopening benefits, and then uh, idiosyncratic factors affecting India and Indonesia. Okay. What's your view on CapEx in India? Uh, I mean, we've not, we've not seen any big projects being announced except in perhaps renewables. Uh, banks show a lot of credit growth, but that's more retail-driven. Uh, do you expect the capex cycle to grow or are you already seeing it underway well it is already being seen uh, if you look at uh, you know the uh, cmi projects under implementation that has picked up quite nicely at the same time uh, banks credit growth for industry has also started to show a recovery now uh, i mean retail credit growth is higher but in terms of the momentum you are seeing a pickup in the industrial credit growth as well 
And at the same time, uh, you know, we are seeing these uh, announcements coming in from multinationals to invest into India for outsourcing. Uh, so, you know, the Apple's uh, supply chain is, uh, is a case in example. Uh, then we heard about the, the Tata and the Airbus uh, project being announced in Gujarat. So we are seeing a lot of these uh, investments on an anecdotal basis coming in through. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the big picture story is that, you know, at this point of time, the corporate balance sheets are in a good shape. Um, you have that, uh, you know, support from structural reforms. Uh, corporation tax reduction that happened, Lata, we didn't, never really had the time to see the utilization of that cap, uh, corporate tax reduction in the supply side response. It's happening only now because we had the COVID situation to handle. But now that COVID situation is behind us, we are seeing that supply side response from the corporate sector and the CapEx cycle is already picking up. Okay, uh, That's very convincing, uh, Chetan. But just one more, uh, uh, you know, uh, devil's advocate to a skeptical question. Uh, what about this K-shaped recovery? You know, a lot of the uh, staples companies, uh, be it Hindustan Unilever or Marico or, uh, you know, uh, Darbar, many of them have uh, reported only low single-digit volume growth. Whatever little realization that's more price-led growth. As well, uh, you know, two-wheelers tell us the entry-level segment is not doing too well. Would that be a bother? So uh, we think that, you know, whenever you're thinking about rural India, uh, it will always be lagging the urban recovery. Uh, so if you go back to 2003 to 7, that's kind of what happened. In the initial phases, you started to see pick up in the urban economy, manufacturing investments picking up, job creation picking up, and then you will see migration. And then there will be a follow through of demand improvement in rural India. Uh, the other thing which is affecting the farmers is terms of trade. So we've seen a big rise in uh, WPI inflation and commodity prices, uh, while at the same time, if you think about the MSP uh, or minimum support price increases for farm produce, that's not been that strong. But going forward, we are expecting, you already saw that you know WPI print has uh, been coming off, and going forward as uh, commodity prices come off on a YY basis, at the same time, the farm product price increases are still maintaining at a healthy level of 5 to 7 percent. That improvement in terms of trade will also begin to help rural demand. Uh, you know, Chetan, uh, you referred to the 2004 to 2008 period, and sometimes it feels like that because we are starting with cleaner bank and corporate balance sheets. But your uh, forecasts are all... Uh, sub 6.5% GDP growth up until F525. Uh, you think it's going to be a big ask to get, or is there an upside bias? Uh, is it possible we'll get to 7? Uh, I think for uh, F2024, uh, I think the, the risks are more balanced uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, you do have this global slowdown that is taking place right now. Sure. So you mentioned about, uh, you know, exports being weak. And that's the key reason why we have GDP growth at 6.2% for next year. Okay. But the year after, I think you, you have some uh, potential for upside risk. And of course, that will depend a lot on what happens to the rest of the world or what happens to export growth dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, in F2025, we are still expecting a pretty reasonable growth of 6.5%. Uh, okay, you know, a final question again from a skeptic. In 2008 and 9, I very clearly remember, we kept saying that this is a... OECD problem. This is a, you know, a, a Atlantic uh, seaboard problem. It's not a global problem. But three years later, it very much became an India slowdown as well. Uh, do you think we can take growth for granted or will it still be contingent on, you know, us getting the right policies? Well, so in 2008, we had a pretty big recession. Uh, and to the extent to which that we had a proper balance sheet recession in DMs. Yes. Uh, but in this cycle, uh, we think there are a few different circumstances which is going to ensure that we don't have a deeper recession. So we are expecting U.S. GDP growth to be weak, but we're expecting it to be about half a percent next year. Um, and the key reason why we don't see a deeper recession is that the balance sheets are in a very different shape. So if you take the U.S. household balance sheet, 90% um, of their liabilities are fixed interest rates. 98% of mortgages in the U.S. are fixed interest rates. And at the same time, uh, the corp for the corporate sector, if you look at the riskiest component of the corporate sector, which is high-yield corporate sector, um, that sector has uh, termed out its debt, i.e. that over the next two years, you only have about 10% of the liabilities falling due. 
So that's going to ensure that this interest rate increases that you have seen in the U.S. does not impair either household or corporate balance sheet, and you don't get a significant retrenchment in demand uh, because of this um, interest rate increases. So I think this unique aspect of the U.S. balance sheets in this cycle is what makes us believe that you're not going to have that deeper recession that you had in 2008. And so if you're going to have a, a soft landing in the U.S., it then therefore uh, makes us believe that you know India can get away without seeing a, a huge negative impact out of the U.S. slowdown. Hey, this is music to our ears. Chetan Ahir, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for joining us and, of course, giving us an optimistic view of 2023 and behind. With that, we wrap up this special Morgan Stanley view. Thank you very much for watching.